You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Today, I'm really excited to have Kyle Mills back on the show with me again. Kyle is one of my favorite authors on the planet, and uh, I'm excited to talk about the new Mitch Rapp book, uh, book 17. Is that right, Kyle? 17 in the series now? I think this is 19, maybe. 19. Oh. Okay. I think you might, you might not be counting the two prequels. Yeah, the, probably so. Probably so. And I, I'm I'm going by what uh, what Amazon has, uh, and oh. it kind of caught me off guard. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. I, I forgot about the two prequels in there as well. That's uh, that's amazing. How how have you been? Uh, you know, 2020 is uh, has been a bit of a dumpster fire for everybody. <laughs> and um, how are yeah. you guys holding up? Uh, you know, not bad. It's uh. You know, I feel like we're the fortunate ones, really. I mean, I, I, you know, I already work in my basement alone and uh, we live in Wyoming, a state that has very few people in it. Um, So, you know, and, and, you know, people are buying books. So, uh, you know, a lot of people are really struggling and suffering out there, which I'm very conscious, conscious of. And uh, but we've we've done pretty well. That's that's oh. amazing. the The last time we talked, were you in Spain and uh, and yeah. doing some some cycling and and more rock climbing? Yeah. Uh. Well, we live part of the time there, and uh, uh we should be there now. But uh, we were supposed to leave on June first, and we kind of spend a year in Wyoming and a year in Spain, and. Uh, Unfortunately, it didn't seem like a very good uh, good idea to get on a plane on June first. So uh, <laughs> yeah. we're here instead. Yeah. We've we've stayed, and we'll see how things go. You know, reading over the the new book, Total Power, and um, I I kind of laugh at the pun uh, of the title that you you don't really get until you get into the book, and I was like, well, that's that's kind of clever. Um, but you know, um. It, it's kind of funny with thriller writers, you you ask these questions, uh, you know, did you see so and so coming down the pike? And uh, and of course, n- no one can can see the future. But uh, what an interesting set of circumstances that you dreamed up for this new book. Yeah, I mean, that is the fun thing. I mean, you know, the last one I did oddly was about a bat born coronavirus. Um, so the timing on that was. Uh, sort of unfortunate. Uh, but yeah, th- this is one I've been thinking about for a long time. I, uh, I wrote a book years ago called Darkness Falls that was sort of about an environmental terrorist group trying to take out the world's oil supply. And in the end, the guy, you know, the hero saves the day. And I always thought you know, that was a mistake, that maybe the story was he doesn't save the day and everything goes dark and then they have to you know, figure out how to fix it. And so I've had that in the back of my mind forever. And I finally got to, I finally got to explore that. Like what would happen in this case, it's not the oil supply. It's, it's the U S electrical grid. Like how would you take it down? And if you did, like what would happen to American society if, you know, everything suddenly went dark and it stayed dark? Well, some some interesting things have happened this year. Um, you know, back in the spring when when everything just started shutting down, and then we saw, you know, within just a a few days, really, um, how our supply chain uh, could be affected. And it started, you you started going to the grocery store when you could, and you know, shelves are just empty, and and you start realizing what a precarious position we really live in and and how much faith and trust we put into 
um, you know, kind of every cog in in the in the machine uh, that makes up our society. And it really became sobering uh, to think of just how quickly life could change. Um, it, you know, when you're going through that stuff this past spring, and and you know, total power was was done and off your desk by then, I'm sure. Um, but you know, did you start kind of thinking about the story that you had written and, and wow, you know, this is, uh, this is a little fortuitous to, to think that I was thinking about this. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I did. I, it's kind of an interesting, I mean, with coronavirus, it's interesting because when I first started writing this book, I really thought a lot about how to impress on people, how serious this would be, because I thought there might be this reaction that, oh, I've been through blackouts before. You know, it's annoying. You have to read by candlelight or whatever for a few hours, but it's not that big of a deal. It's something we've all, you know, experienced. <clears throat> so with coronavirus, my scenario becomes much clearer to people. I mean, it becomes, you know, it, they can feel it a little bit on a gut level for exactly the reason that you said. And so now I have kind of gone back and thought, did I get everything right? And yeah, I feel like it's pretty accurate. I mean, it's followed. I was afraid there would be something that I completely missed um, <clears throat> that would happen as supply chains and everything broke down. I'd say the big one that I missed is the hair care issues. Like people are really freaked out about their hair. <laughs> And, and yeah. I, didn't, I didn't think of, I, I got the toilet paper. I thought that everybody would, would hoard toilet paper, but hair care products, I, I, I missed that. How, being a guy with not much hair. Yeah, me too. Me too. But w living with a, a, a family full of women, um, these things, uh, you know, become uh, kind of front and, and center of, of your thought. <laughs> it's, it's really funny. Do, as a thriller writer who who dreams up worst case scenarios, when you start think, seeing some of those worst case scenarios um, come true, does that embolden you for the next project coming up? Like, oh my gosh, let, let's ramp up what I'm what I'm thinking about, or does does it have the opposite effect where it's sort of crippling? Um, you know, well, gosh, every time I come up with something. Um, the world kind of follows along and maybe I don't want to go down this thought path again. Well, it is kind of interesting on this one <clears throat> because, yeah, I, you know, with the coronavirus thing, a lot of people have said this to me. They're like, well, geez, you kind of predicted the coronavirus or mm -hmm. we're not about to have a massive blackout now. I'm starting to get a little scared. I, I did the same thing with a book called Sphere of Influence where I had written a book kind of about 9-11 but I turned it in a week before 9-11. And I remember my wife calling me from work and saying, you need to turn on the TV because your new book's playing out on it. And oh, I actually I edited, sent the book back to me and said it was unpublishable. Uh, and I had to rewrite it in order to, in order to get it published. So yeah, it does kind of, I don't know, sometimes it does keep me up at night a little bit. That's, that's hilarious. So uh, Total Power, the new book, um, which when people are hearing this, it's available everywhere and there's links to it in the show notes to make it easier for you to find it. Um, is this the sixth um, uh, Mitch Rapp book that you've written? It is. Yeah. And uh, did I did I see that you signed up for another trilogy coming up? I did. Just yeah. just did. Yeah. So three more. Congratulations on that. Like, yeah, it's kind of kind of amazing. I, I've never. I never thought I would. Uh, well, certainly, I never thought I would take over the Mitch Rap uh, right. first, and I certainly didn't think I'd do it for nine books. Well, you know, when you've got a character like Mitch Rap, who who people love and they are invested in, and you know, Vince Flynn did such an amazing job of of setting this world and um, uh, you know, getting all the the pieces in place. When you come in and, and get to take over a series like this. I, I can only imagine I've not done this, but I can only imagine that it feels like, um, uh, you know, that you're inheriting toys from maybe an older sibling or a, a neighbor or something like that. And, and so you're getting to play in someone else's toy box uh, with the best toys available. But after six books and now you're looking at three more, 
um does it feel like um you know it does it ever feel like that that mitch is yours that that these are um things that you're in control of now does that even make sense it just it feels yeah. like that you know at some point um do you get to take ownership of this and do you feel like that uh you know that, that this is something that that kyle is in control of now Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.community. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'm not sure anybody's ever asked me that. Um... The answer is, interestingly, yes, um, but it really didn't happen, I wouldn't say, until Total Power. Wow. Because, you know, for a long time, I've been working with the universe that Vince created. Um, but after six books and six years, the world has changed. The characters, a lot of the characters, obviously, you know, Irene and Mitch and and Scott and all those are, are evergreen, but a lot of the older characters that have, were specific to storylines he did in the past um, have kind of necessarily fallen away. You know, he's not, you know, dealing with, I, I, bring, I bring him back every now and then, but, you know, Donatella is not a, a major character anymore in the books and things like that. So, and then I've populated it with a number of my own characters, you know, people like Grisha Azarov and, and some others. So it has actually started to feel a little bit like mine. Um, it always takes me a while to do that. You know, I remember when I first started writing, for years I felt like an imposter. I would do interviews or whatever. Or I'd lecture on writing and I'd think, oh my God, these people are going to find out you know, I'm just a banker who wrote a book and <laughs> I didn't know anything about this. And I swear it took like 10 books before I thought, no, no, I'm an author. That's so funny. You know, people talk about imposter syndrome all the time. It's something that every writer goes through at, at some point. Um, but it, it's really real. And uh, do you think that the um, that maybe the cause of some of that is the nature of writing in that when you start a new book, you're really coming to it with a blank slate all over again. And and you have to continue. You have to redo what you did the time before, but do it differently. But do it just just enough alike so that people can come along and you know uh, and continue on the bandwagon, um, but do it differently enough that they feel like they got a, a new experience. Um, that that's kind of crippling if you think about it too much, isn't it? Yeah, it's a real tightrope, and it you know when I wrote books under my own brand, my books were kind of all over the place. I mean, I wrote I don't know kind of. This kind of fiction, I've written books that were general fiction in the first person. Um, you know, I wrote sciencey stuff, kind of whatever I was interested in. And with with the Mitch Rapp stuff, you're exactly right. There's this sort of tightrope walk where you want to, you know, you want to create something new. You want to give Mitch a new challenge and everything. But there's a there's a certain expectation. You know, you don't. You know, if you're working at McDonald's, you don't slap sushi on the table, right? It doesn't matter if it's good or what, but people had an expectation when they came in the restaurant. So you have to write a Mitch Rapp thriller. And that's something I'm particularly conscious of. I mean, Vince, I assume that was fairly easy for him. You know, he developed it. It's, it's what he, you know, it, it was an extension of him. So I always have to be conscious of, you know, am I writing a Mitch Rapp thriller or am I kind of going off on a Kyle Mills tangent? And, uh, uh, I haven't done that yet. I, you know, but I did, but I have taken him into new territory, you know, particularly with a book like, for instance, Red War, where he, uh, kind of battled the Russians and it was a, a, a much different threat than he'd faced in the past. 
Well, speaking of that um, situation where, you know, when you're writing under your own brand and, and you could just kind of write whatever whatever you're thinking about and interested about uh, it in the moment, um, as opposed to writing um, Mitch Rapp where there are there are certain boundaries that you have to function within um, a, as a writer and a creative person. Do you feel like um, you know, th- there's an interesting thing that happens that when you operate within boundaries, um, sometimes it can be more freeing uh, because, it, it, you know, and, and it doesn't seem that way. It seems like it would be opposite of that, that the the more boundaries you have, the more stifled you would feel. But sometimes it's more freeing when you don't have to think of all the extraneous things that could go into it. Um, have you, do you have any sort of feeling about, you know, the operating within the bounds that are Mitch Rapp, uh, books? For me, it's certainly just as creative and in a, but it's just a little more challenging in the sense that you can't, you know, say I'm going to, you know, write a romance novel. And that'll be really new and different to me and a real challenge. The challenge comes that, you know, if I stay within these these boundaries, can I still produce something really creative and that's very different than what I've produced before, but that fans will still love? So, you know, I mean, this one, and that's true of every book I write. If you, It's maybe not apparent to readers, but for every book, I give myself a new challenge and I give Mitch a new challenge to see how he'll react to it. So this one, even maybe more so than the power going out, the idea here was Mitch has always been the guy who saved the day. What if he didn't? You know, what, what if he had to pick up the pieces instead? He doesn't like failure. So how would he handle it? And that was what got me excited, even more so than the power scenario, which I was super interested in. But it got me excited to think, you know, how would Mitch react to something like this? What what uh, what has been fan reaction to uh, to taking over a series uh, like Mitch Rap, where there are, there's this built in huge audience of people that that loved uh, the books that Vince Flynn wrote and were. Uh, rabid for new releases. What's it like walking into um, a situation like that and taking over such a beloved character? What was fan reaction like when you uh, came in and took over? Uh, it was incredibly positive. It, it was terrifying for me. Uh, you know, when I first, I well, when I first was offered for the job, I I didn't immediately answer. You know, I uh, one I had to decide whether I thought I could do it you know, credibly. And the second was, I thought, even if I can, are fans going to react really negatively to this? Are are they going to say, you know, this was, you know, Vince's baby and you're kind of usurping it. um, And we wanted, you know, it should die with Vince. Um, That was absolutely not the reaction. So, well, I mean, to Vince's credit, that guy created a character, just an iconic character that to people was, they were real. You know, Vin, Mitch Rapp is real. And I mean, I felt the same way as a fan. I remember thinking when Vince died, you know, how horrible it was. But then I, then I thought, well, you know, at the end of The Last Man, it just sort of leaves him hanging. You know, I, there's no closure. What happened to Mitch? And that was very much the reaction. People wanted to see Vince's legacy um, continue, and they wanted to, you know, they wanted their friend back. You know, this, I mean, for all of us who are fans of these series, you know, whether it's Mitch Rapp or Scott Horvath, or, you know, J- Jack Ryan, these are friends that we visit once a year to see what they're up to, and and it leaves a big hole in your life if they just go away. Absolutely. Um, you know, you get invested in these characters and, and they do take on a, a persona that's that's larger than life. And um, it, it's it's such a weird thing, uh, you know, what writing can do and can can conjure people out of thin air. It's a uh, it's crazy that, that we get to do this, uh, this thing and, and to affect people's lives. It's a uh, it, it it's really humbling when you when you really think about it. Yeah, it is. And it's incredible how real these people uh, are. 
and how they how real they become to you and how you know I get I get a ton of of fan mail and and people it's really fun to watch you know people talk about Mitch and and you know Claudia and Scott and all these people just as though they are real you know they what why why would Scott do this or you're not gonna kill off this guy are you I love this guy and all this and and it's <laughs> it's really fun because you know that they share my feeling and because I, I I hang out with these guys all day you know they they talk to me and they do things that surprise me and they go off on tangents that I never imagined, you know? And so to me, they're very real. I mean, I've known Mitch since he was in college. So uh, it's fun to know that fans share that. That's awesome. When, when you're writing um, a, a book like Total Power and, and, and writing in a series um, like the Mitch Rap series, how do you manage the sheer size and scope of these books? Because one thing that, that you know when you, when you read a Mitch Rap book is the, the stage is very big. Um, there are lots of moving parts and characters and um, uh, lots going on. Um, how do you manage something like this i mean do you keep all this in your head do you have some sort of database that you know this character is going to be here and and this is their sphere of influence and like like that's a lot of pieces to juggle how do you manage that uh well when i first took it over i went back and reread all the books kind of in one push i think it took me three months and i took i don't know probably 150 pages of notes so that's my main database. I also have a friend who's a huge Mitch Rapp fanatic named Ryan Steck, the real book spy. And he uh, has an in, even more encyclopedic knowledge of the universe. So if I ever get stuck, I actually did on this book and the, or on the book I'm writing right now. And uh, I could go back and say, I seem to remember this, but I don't know what book it was in and what, exactly what character it was. And he helps me. Um, and, but it is, yeah, it's really hard to keep it all put together and it's really hard to get it across to people. Um, and with Vince to, to write it at a, at a, at the sort of sales level that Vince does, you, you kind of have to make decisions about it on how you're going to get it across to people. So I wrote a series character for a few books early in my career and the, and the books did well. I mean, you know, got on the New York times bestseller list, at a low level and everything. But I always had to be conscious with that, that a lot, I, every time I wrote a book, I, a lot of people who hadn't read me before were going to read that book. Um, so I was constantly thinking about how can I introduce these characters to new readers, but also not bore old readers. You know, I don't want to sit there and go into my character, Mark Beeman's entire, you know, life because, uh, you know, my fans have already read it. So actually, I quit writing those books after four because it became the world started becoming so big and so complex that it was really hard to manage. With Vince, though, he's such a huge author and so popular. He was able to sort of make the decision, well, if you don't understand who these characters are, you know, go back and read the rest of the series. Um, and I've kind of continued that because it's such a huge universe, you know spanning 20 years uh there's just no way to go into it and say oh you've never read one of these books before uh well here's who all these people are and what they've done in their history and mitch's wife died and you know all this stuff so um it's a little freeing i think to to be able to ride vince's coattails on that one <laughs> for sure um Thrillers are are one of the um, the biggest um, selling genres right now. We love these stories where we're taken on a ride and the stakes are really really high. Um, psychological thrillers are are very popular right now, um, but for different reasons. I, I feel like um, a lot of time the the camera, if you will, is very close on one character, and we're getting a lot of internal monologue and 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 we follow very closely to a character or a, a a very small handful of characters um contrast that with a mitch rap book where 
the stage is very big. There's lots of characters uh, and there's a lot going on. Um, how do you begin a book like this? Usually there's there's a kind of a big concept, like in Total Power. You know, what if the power went out and and it wasn't coming back on anytime soon? What would that mean? So that's kind of a a, a big concept. But then inside the book, there are lots of smaller concepts which kind of lead up to this and, and tie in. Um, what when you're thinking about a brand new book, um, what's that what's that process for thinking of of a big idea and then how does that look and what would that mean for society? Can, what what's your your process for teasing out what the what that new plot's going to be? Uh, you know, for me, on a book like Total Power, I mean, uh, they're all a little different depending on how big your concept is. Uh. For me, total a book like Total Power is fairly easy to write because it tends to write itself. I I like books that are very realistic. So in theory, you know, if unless I've made a mistake, if I if somebody's in Uganda and they turn left on such and such a street and run into a stoplight, that stoplight's there. You know, if I tell you the government does this and this is who does it and this is where they are, you know, that's all going to be true. And so your research can can write a lot of your book for you. So from from the standpoint of total power, I said, you know, it was very much what you say, you know, you've, you've posed this big question, what would happen if, um, you know, the power went out? And my background actually educationally is in economics. And it kind of works for me because economists all sit around and think, you know, given all these factors, that get dumped into this, you know, kind of pool, muddy pool, what happens, you know? And that's what we did, what I did there is what would happen? You know, what would happen to people? What would happen to, what would the government do? How would they react? How would the military react? How would foreign powers, you know, react? What would happen to them? You know, you think, you know, initially you think something like China, okay, China's going to twist its mustache and go, ha, 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 look at, you know, America's collapsing. And then 10 minutes later, though, they're going to realize, wait, who's going to buy all our stuff, you know, and then their economy collapses too. So you, it's an interesting thing to sort of plod along through. And that's basically what I do. You know, I sit there and I think, okay, and now, you know, whatever, China's economy has collapsed. So what happens then? Like, you know, now can they can't help us, you know, because they're focused on their own problems, and <clears throat> and it just eventually grows into, you know, one day you go, hey, I think I've got enough for a novel here. When when you're researching uh, for this book, were there anything uh, that you came a- along that legitimately scared you, like like holy crap, I can't believe that we, uh, y- you know, we walk on this razor's edge every day and we just take for granted that everything works. Were were there any situations like that that you came across? Yeah, a lot of them, probably more than any other scenario I've ever looked at. Even the coronavirus that I you know, wrote about, you know, you have a long history of that. We had SARS, we've had the plague, you know, so you know that's serious. Um, with this one, though, I was surprised when you really look into it, one, that there have already been attacks on our power grid, um, both physical attacks and cyber attacks that are known um, that there isn't much protection and that Congress has looked into these things. And according to them, if the power went out and stayed out for a year, 90% of the U.S. population would die. Um, So that's 300 million people. Um, So it's a fairly serious uh, scenario. And then when you play it out, on the different levels. And that's kind of what I did with my book is I tried to have everybody, you know, you saw it from, you know, kind of a ground level or just a normal person, how they were dealing with it. You see it from Mitch's level. He's obviously much more prepared. You see it from the government's level, um, how all these different people deal with, you know, something this catastrophic. And if you think about it, I mean, if anybody just sits down and thinks for a minute, what would happen if, you know, I, and I think you've thought about that all the time. Okay, it's dark. You know, there's no power. 
<clears throat> one of the other things I had never thought about that's the most serious problem is that uh, water, public water, relies on power. So now you're sitting in the dark, it's cold, um, the grocery stores are empty, and now your, the water at your house goes out. You got nothing to drink, there's no sanitation. Nobody's coming to help you because it's out all over the country. It's not like a normal blackout. You know, New York goes out and they stage, you know, uh, rescue efforts from wherever, North Carolina or wherever, because um, that doesn't exist. Even Canada can't help us because a bunch of their power grid goes down with ours since they're connected. So it's, uh, it's quite a terrifying scenario um, and much more so than I thought to the point where I actually had to soften it in my book. I, I, you'll notice when you read the book that it, it happens around Christmas time. And originally it was in the summer because that's when you really take out the grid. And I think my character mentions that, that he's really PO'd, that he can't do it in the summer. Um, and when I ran into the, the scenario in the summer, there was no way that we could be saved like no nothing i couldn't figure out anything mitch rapp or the government could do that everybody in america didn't just die so i moved it to the winter man that's crazy um you know we we've all been dealing with uh the realities of uh of covid19 this this particular coronavirus this year um yeah and and i've loved asking writers uh this question because you know writers tend to spend a lot of time by themselves working on the next project uh, a lot of times in a home office uh, so uh, you know we don't really go uh, lots of places we're, we're not typically really social animals um it, it's kind of funny um so you would think that uh, a, a situation like this and a you know nationwide lockdown and a really a global lockdown uh, wouldn't have a lot of impact on writers and and i know that you you know this really kind of changed your your family's travel plans this year um but how has this this situation this lockdown affected you and your creativity because I, i've noticed a lot of people um, even though it should just kind of be business as usual there's a lot of kind of mental aspects that are that are going on and affecting people um how's it affecting you honestly it hasn't been that bad uh, you know, I am kind of a little reclusive anyway, probably. And my main sort of activities that I do for my, for my own mental health are outdoor athletics. So, you know, backcountry skiing and mountain biking and trail running and things like that. And because I live in Wyoming where there are no people, <laughs> the, <laughs> none of those things have been affected. So, I mean, I still work all day and then I, get on my mountain bike or whatever and go out into the middle of the nowhere and pedal around and, or go out into the mountains and ski. Um, so <clears throat> other than, you know, like you said, I can't travel, which is kind of a pain. Uh, it, it really hasn't been too bad. Um, it's, it would be nice to see more of friends and be able to go out to dinner and stuff, but compared to what most people are dealing with, I think uh, I'm probably almost in an ideal situation in that the things I do haven't largely been that affected. That's great. Uh, and now that we have the new book, to Total Power is out everywhere, and we have more Mitch Rap to look forward to. I, I know that has a lot of people excited. Um, Vince, how far into uh, next year's book are you at this point? Oh, pretty far. Uh Probably it's hard to it's hard to say how far I am into a book. I know I just wrote page sixty eight, but that sounds like I'm, it's not very far. But I I write really elaborate outlines, so my outline is done. It's like forty thousand words or something, and then I'm you know a good chunk through the writing process of the first draft. So probably a little more than half. Yeah, probably halfway done or something with the book. Um, so it's all laid out and everything. It's just a matter of getting it down on paper. That's fantastic. Uh, we we all know, uh, you know, when it's uh, Mitch Rap time of the year, and uh, I, I know everyone's gonna run out and grab the new book and uh, continue to love Mitch Rap the way that we do. Um, Kyle, tell people where they can find you online if they want to dig into all the great stuff that you do and 
you know, get a hold of your massive back catalog and 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 all of that? Uh, so just kylemills.com. You can find me on the web, and then I'm at Kyle Mills Author. Uh, you know, in all the places that you think, you know, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So if you want to follow me there, you can, uh, or you can just shoot over to my website and I have, you know, stuff on the new book, you know, excerpts and links and, and stuff on my old books. So you can kind of, you know, look at all as much as you want to there. Excellent. We're going to send everyone to see you, uh, Kyle and to pick up their copy of total power. You're going to love this book. I, I was just telling, uh, Kyle before we started recording that I've been listening to the audio book. Um, I'm about uh, almost halfway through the audio at the time that we're um, uh, recording this, and I've already read the uh, the physical copy. And this is this is amazing. You guys are going to totally love it. Um, Kyle, thank you so much for taking time to come back on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. World Anvil is a browser-based world-building platform designed for all world builders writers and novelists, dungeon masters, game developers, and everyone else. World Anvil keeps your world setting safe and organized, helps you find your characters, locations, plots, timelines, and maps quickly and easily as you write. Then, if you choose, you can showcase your amazing world building to the world, beautifully and interactively, to keep your readers engaged. You can even use our professional tier to build your career selling access to behind the scenes content your readers will love and growing your community. Build your world setting in any genre with over 25 custom built world building templates complete with prompts to inspire your creativity. Allow your readers to explore the public parts of your world in an innovative new way with interactive maps, timelines and wiki style articles. Give special access to co-authors, beta readers, customers or patrons to see exclusive behind the scenes content. There's a free version to get started with, with all of the major features. Guild membership offers you a host of extra options, including comprehensive privacy settings, co-authors, presentation options, and so much more. Join our community of over 800,000 world builders, including professional authors. Take part in competitions and learn more about world building at this fantastic online community. Use the coupon code HANK to get 20% off all 6 and 12 month subscriptions. WorldAnvil.com. I'm a recent convert and I know you will be too.